The reason that I'm here on the platform this morning is uh, on Monday morning, I got a call from Pastor Allen. Uh, he had received a call from Atlanta where his dad lives, and the call said that his dad was not doing well at all. His dad had been put into hospice several weeks earlier, so um, Pastor Allen got on a flight Monday and arrived in Atlanta Monday afternoon and was able to see his dad for about 20 minutes before his dad passed away into eternity. So Pastor Allen and the entire family obviously are gathering um, in Atlanta to say goodbye to the patriarch of their family. Pastor Samuel Latta, 83 years old, passed away Monday. Uh, his viewing will be tomorrow evening and then the final services, he'll be laid to rest. Uh, the services will take place at a church in Jonesboro, Georgia on Tuesday about midday. Um, Pastor Samuel was a man that had actually filled this pulpit several times. And uh, he was one of those guys that was bigger than life, bigger than life. Built several churches actually by hand, a missionary to Africa on a number of occasions. And... Uh, I'm sure that his family will miss him as they say goodbye. So they're gathering in Atlanta right now. There's a lot of details to be worked out in regards to uh, Pastor Samuel's estate. So can we just pray for him and his family before we, before we go on? Would that be all right? Let's just lift them up. Well, Father, we just thank you for um, Pastor Samuel, a life that was well-lived for your kingdom, Lord. Father, we thank you for the, uh, the entire Latta family, Mama Shirley and her family as well, Father God. I thank you, Lord God, that you visit them with your peace, your mercy, your grace, your love um, as they gather to say goodbye to their patriarch, Lord. I thank you, Lord God, that you'll be in the midst of all of the arrangements, all of the uh, estate issues that have to be taken care of, Father. I think you're... Thank you, Lord, that you're a part of that. Most of all, Father, I thank you, Lord God, that this will be a time of love and, and restoration of relationships back there in Atlanta uh, as they celebrate Pastor Samuel's life. In Jesus' name, amen. You can open up your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, and also to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Those are the the passages that I'll be using today as, as we preach. Um, 2 Peter 3 is towards the back of your Bible, and then you just flip left a few books, and you'll find 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Go ahead and put up the passage for Amos. But to set, the, to set the tone of the word that God has given me to give to you, church, this, this morning, I came across this passage. This is from the Message Translation. And I believe it's in Amos 9. And Amos is actually prophesying here about the restoration of God's intended kingdom. Listen to what he says. Yes, indeed, it won't be long now. God's decree. Things are going to happen so fast your head will swim. One thing fast on the hills of the other. You won't be able to keep up. Everything will be happening at once. Whoa! It's kind of like today, isn't it? I mean, it seems like things are going so fast, we're not even able to recover from the report of one disaster, not only in the world, but here in the United States, till we move on to the next thing that seems that we have to deal with. Uh, and, and not just disasters in terms of natural disasters, but I'm talking about things that come at us that are man-made as well, decisions that are passed down by the Supreme Court, or decisions that our leg legislators make, or that they that make are made in another state that have an effect on all of us. I mean, it's just one thing after the other. And so these are the days that we live in, brothers and sisters. I really believe that. Things happening so fast that we really have a hard time keeping up. What it does is it prompts us to begin to turn to something that's true. And that's what God has given me to talk to you about today. Um, 
I'm going to start by with a story that I will serve to actually illustrate what this message is all about. And I can't get through this story without, and I apologize right up front, because a lot of times when I tell this story, I get tickled because I'm a railroad guy. Anyway, as you know, I was a, a train master for the railroad for a number of years. And I went to Cerritos, California to go to the simulator, the locomotive simulator out there. And I met a friend of mine who was also out at the simulator. And he was a train master on a district in, in uh, East Texas, a district that where the trains ran in what they call dark territory, which means that there were no signals. Here's the way you did that, because think about this. Um, the trains would actually, before they left their station, they would actually get a set of train orders. And these train orders were super important. They would say, extra 6229 East, meet extra 9292 West at such and such a siding, extra 9292 West, take siding. So what the guys would do is they'd be on the head end of the train and they'd be looking at these train orders and every time they passed a train at a meeting point in their train orders, the, both trains would have their number lights illuminated at night. And so they could say, okay, that guy was 9292 West. He was in the siding. What's my next meet? Okay. A couple of things that you need to know about trains. <clears throat> number one, trains take a long, long, long time to stop because they're heavy. I mean, they don't stop like a car. I mean, it's bad. It's bad. I'm just telling you. And the other thing is, is that if you don't get stopped, you're guaranteed on a train to run into something. You ain't steering. You're going to run into it. So this friend of mine that was a train master in East Texas t told me this story. <laughs> I'm already getting tickled. I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, he told me a story about a, a, a situation that he had on his district. It was dark territory. These trains are running back and forth, and it's in the middle of the night. No lights. And if you, I, I can only describe this to you if you've been out there. The railroads typically run between cities, but they don't run even close to a highway. So it's not like a highway. You're in the middle of nowhere, in the forest, in the dark. It's almost scary. And so... These guys had a train order to meet another train at such and such a siding. And they're running at 60 miles an hour. And they're looking at their train orders. The guys are on the, this is back when we were running cabooses as well. And they're looking at the train orders and they see that the train is up there because they can see a dimmed headlight. And they're looking at their train orders and the guy is supposed to be in the siding. And the fireman that's on the head end of the locomotive, he looks at his train orders, he looks up there, and they're doing 60, and the fireman says, he's on the main track! And he jumps up and he opens the front window, front door and goes off and bails off the train. <laughs> you know, just 60 miles an hour jumps. So, so the engineer, you know, he begins to have some doubt, and he's over there, and he begins to set his brakes a little bit, you know, get throttled back. And the brakeman that's on the head end of the train watches the fireman go out and jump off. And he's looking at his train orders, and he looks. Yeah, he's on the main track. So he jumps up. Now they're down to about 40 miles an hour, and he bails off. He just jumps off. So the locomotive engineer, he's looking, and he's sure the guy's in the siding the way that he's supposed to be. But the locomotive engineer looks at the two guys that have already left, and he says, and the heck with it. So he puts the train into emergency. Boom! That's what it sounds like when they go into emergency. And he jumps off, and he leaves. Still doing about 35 miles an hour. It's not a good situation. Not good. So in those days, we had what we call a red Mars light on the front end of the locomotive. And the red light comes on, which indicates that the train has gone into an emergency application, and it begins to oscillate in the front, like this, like a figure eight. So the guys that are in the siding, they see the train that's coming at them go into emergency, and the train gets stopped about 200 yards from them. Okay? So they're waiting, they're waiting, they're waiting, you know? And finally, 
they decide, man, this guy is not recovering his air. He's not taking his train out of emergency. Better go see what happened. So they send their brakeman up to the head end of the train that went into emergency. So he walks over there through the dark, gets up, gets up on the head end of the, of the train, he looks around, there's nobody there. <laughs> I'm getting tickled, I'm sorry. <laughs> so he picks up the radio and he goes, uh, extra 92-92 east, uh, this is a, I'm on the head end of the 6229 west, and there's nobody up here. <laughs> and so the guys that are on the caboose of the train that went into emergency finally wake up, the conductor picks up the radio and goes, uh, this is the rear end of the 6229 west. What do you mean there's nobody up there? <laughs> and the guy on the head then says, well, I'm the brakeman on the eastbound, and I'm up here, and there ain't anybody up here. And the, <laughs> this is the understatement of understatements in railroad jargon. <laughs> the guy on the caboose, <laughs> conductor on the caboose goes, well, they were up there when we left. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that tickles me. <laughs> so anyway, so I use that as an illustration, we'll come back. Wow. <laughs> I'm tickled. Okay, let's, <laughs> we're going to go to the scriptures. <laughs> I got to pray. <laughs> oh my. Well, Father, I just thank you for the, the word that you've given me to speak this morning, Lord. I thank you, Lord God, for um, not only the good illustrations that we have that are funny, Father God, but the seriousness of your word, Father. Help me to get out of your way as, uh, as I deliver what you've given me to speak to your church, Father. Every word I give to you, Father God. I thank you, Father God, for the people that are gathered here in this place, that you prepare their hearts to hear your truth in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. <clears throat> All right, so we're in 2 Peter chapter 3. Last time I had a chance to address all of you, um, I actually used a passage from 2 Peter chapter 3, so there's a theme going on here. We'll start in verse 3, and if you don't have it, then Kaylee's got it on the Sky Bible there. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. In other words, ain't nothing going on here. Come on. He ain't coming. Let's drop down to verse 10. Peter writes, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt away as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens, and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. Now, I want to stop right there. I'm going to continue on, but I want to stop right there and say, right here is something remarkable that you may miss if I, let, if I get by it. Peter is writing about the letters of Paul. Now, the word of God has not yet been canonized officially, but Peter is referring to Paul's letters as scripture. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is already breathing 
Don't let anybody tell you that these letters are not the holy word of God. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Awesome. What Peter is talking about. That's interesting. We'll go over now. Let's flip back over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Obviously addressing the same issues. Here's what Paul says to the church of Thessalonica. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So let, then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. And then let's jump down to the middle of verse 13. Be at peace among yourselves, and we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What an ox, awesome exhortation that is, appears in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 from, from the writings of Paul. I love that exhortation, by the way. You know, there are times when the scriptures, the word of God, speak to us in very definitive detail to a very fine level. And there are some of these passages that we just read, that are speaking personally to each and every one of us. It's true. A lot of the Proverbs speak to us as individuals. And Peter and Paul are, are speaking to us as individuals here. But there's something that's a little bit bigger at work here as well. This, these words are speaking a much bigger picture about what God is doing to restore his image to us so that we can worship him properly. I believe that the entire word of God is all about God's plan to talk about, yeah, we lost the ability to communicate directly to him, to operate in his image the way we were created when Adam sinned in the garden but God's got a bigger picture, and he wants to restore his image to each and every one of us. Wow. That's what God's all about. Restore his image to each and every one of us so that we can properly worship him because that's what we were created to do. That's what we were created to do, worship God, and worship God the way that we can only, only we can relate to him because we are made in his image. I'm amazed by what we see in these two passages. We see two men, fathers of the church, with vastly different experiences, but coming together in a very similar response. We've got, on the one hand, we've got Peter, who many people would consider uneducated, uneducated. And he's writing to a church in the, a displaced, mostly Jewish church. They've been displaced from Israel and been displaced to Asia Minor, and they're under persecution. And Peter, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, begins to say, hey, I know that you guys are being persecuted, but this is, this is how you're going to deal with it. Paul, on the other hand, is highly educated. We know that. 
And he's writing to a church in Thessalonica, and he is... Um, he knows Jesus only in the light of his resurrection. He knows Jesus after the cross. He's having a personal encounter with Jesus, but not the way that Peter knows Jesus. Peter knows Jesus personally. Paul knows Jesus, yes, personally, but post the resurrection. So they're coming at it from two different directions, but they're both addressing the same thing, the same questions. And here's the thing. It's obvious that for both of these churches, they're under persecution. And persecution of a church automatically brings questions. It just does. When a church is persecuted, the response for a church typically is, Jesus, we know that you're coming back. Please just come back and get it over with. Right? I mean, it's better than the alternative. In a lot of cases, I mean, look at the churches that are being persecuted right now in Sudan or China. They'd love for Jesus to come back. But their questions begin to, to look like, okay, G Jesus, can you come back? Can you just get it over with? Can you take us home? We desire to be with you. And, and so I'm sure that these churches are communicating to both Peter and Paul. They're, they're saying, look, tell us about how this all ends. Tell us about the signs that we're looking for. When's it going to happen? You know, what's it going to look like? What's it going to look like? Give us some details. And in both cases, here's the interesting thing. In both cases, operating under the power of the Holy Spirit, these two vastly different men, vastly different experiences, writing to churches that are geographically widespread with a different background, Gentile one, Jew the other, both of them operating under the influence of the Holy Spirit don't answer the questions that are being asked by the church. No. How do they answer? Well, what they do is they, in both cases, they tell the churches, yes, Jesus is coming back, God is going to restore his creation, but this is what you're going to do while you're waiting. This is what you're going to do while you're waiting. They don't give them the, they don't give them the details that we see like in the book of Revelation. No, they answer them and say, it's going to be a glorious day, church, but while you're waiting, these are the things that you're going to do. What a harmony that exists between these two passages this is the word of God talking to us today. I believe that we are entering a period of time that even the church in America will be persecuted. Even the church in America will be persecuted. I'm not talking about the type of persecution that we're seeing currently take place in Sudan, but there are things that are taking place right now that you really do need to understand. Canada, for example, Canada, is jailing pastors for preaching just the word of God on the street corners. At the same time that they're doing that, they're promoting through their CBC, they support the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and they're promoting things like, you know, child drag queens. And they're jailing pastors. And we see what's taking place in California, the same thing is taking place in California right now, pastors, the Assembly of California has just passed a law that dictates that pastors are going to have to embrace things that would be the antithesis of the Word of God. It's coming. It's coming. So what we do is we take note of what, how Paul and Peter have addressed those persecuted churches, and we say, okay, they told, Paul and Peter told those churches what to do. Let's take note of that. This is what we're going to do as we enter into that age of persecution. Things like, things like 2 Peter 3.14, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Echoed by Paul in verse 13, be at peace among yourselves.
Church, we have done a relatively poor job of being unified as a church. And um, we're living in an age where divisiveness seems to be the norm. We just celebrated the 4th of July holiday, and it seemed like there was no place that you could, you couldn't read about the 4th of July holiday without reading about protesters, you know, at any of the celebrations. So our elected leaders and our, and our appointed leaders are not necessarily doing a good job of unifying us. And therefore, the unity really, I believe, needs to start to come out of the church. We need to unify behind the word of God and the fact that we believe that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, each and every one of us. Amen? Amen. That's how unity will be achieved. It doesn't appear that unity will be achieved through any of our government officials. I just don't think that that's going to happen anymore. Here's another one that Peter and Paul agree on. 2 Peter 3.18, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So as we grow in the knowledge of Jesus, we certainly grow in his grace, I believe. If you truly understand Jesus, you grow in his grace. Paul puts it this way, see that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to Do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the Spirit. I think that Peter and Paul are saying the same thing. If we wanted to summarize what Paul just wrote to the Thessalonians, we could say, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what all that means. Sometimes we read what Paul wrote there and we say, what do you mean, man? Pray, like pray without ceasing. How do I do that? Well, the good news is, is that God gave us kind of an instruction book. He bracketed that with exactly how to do it. Okay, so we rejoice always. Well, that's the first part of pray without ceasing. We're going to rejoice in all things because we know that God's at work in our lives. And we're going to Verse 18, give thanks in all circumstances. So we give thanks to God for all things. So if we begin to come, become people of rejoicing and thankful people, then the praying without ceasing naturally takes place. You get it? We're rejoicing, we're giving thanks, and as we're doing that, we're praying to God, God, thank you for what's going on there. God, I see you at work there, I'm rejoicing. And then as we come across needs, we're going to also lift those up to God as well, pray without ceasing, so that we can include God early on in the solution. This is how we get testimonies, right? We approach God and say, God, you know, this is what's going on. I need a miracle. And I know that you can give it to me. And when then God shows up, then you can circle back around and you can give God the glory, and that's what God wants. Amen? So this is how we pray without ceasing. We do these things so that we become people that are set apart from the world. Finally, we need to become people of truth. And this is really, 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 really important in this day and age. Really important. I'm not a big subscriber to the phrase fake news, although I I do believe that it does apply in some cases, but um, we need to know truth in the context of what is going on in our culture, for sure. Here's what I mean by that. Truth unless it is established by something that is an external influence outside of us, all truth has to be relative. I personally thank God that God has given us his truth, and it's right here. Because I don't have to worry about what truth is because I know it's right here. I don't have to develop my own truth. There's a gentleman named Steve Turner 
Steve Turner is a, um, he's a British poet, writer. He writes on things cultural. He's a Christian, but he's a very interesting character. He talks about how do we integrate our Christian culture with the popular culture that's going on around us. And um, he wrote something called An Atheist Creed a number of years ago, and I believe that he actually submitted it to the New York Times and they published it. But I'm going to read just a portion of it. And when I talk about truth, I want you to understand that he is being satirical here. He is a Christian, but he's trying to point out the fallacy of truth other than what exists here. Here's what Steve Turner wrote, an atheist creed. There's more of it. I'm just going to read the end. We believe that man is essentially good. It's only his behavior that lets him down. This is the fault of society. Society is the fault of conditions. Conditions are the fault of society. We believe that each man must find the truth that is right for him. Reality will adopt accordingly. The universe will readjust. History will alter. We believe that there is no absolute truth, excepting the truth that there is no absolute truth. <laughs> we believe in the rejection of creeds and the flowering of individual thought. Now listen to this. Because an atheist believes that truth is their own truth and that they are made in the image of man. What a sad situation. Listen to this. If chance be the father of all flesh, disaster is his rainbow in the sky. And when you hear, state of emergency, sniper kills 10, troops on the rampage, whites go looting, bomb blast school, it is but the sound of man worshiping his maker. Yeah. That's what relative truth brings about. So returning back to what Peter and Paul are exhorting us about is that we have to know the truth. Here's how Peter puts it. Verse 17. Take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. Church. We've got to be stable. We've got to be grounded in the truth. Paul writes in verse 21, test everything. Hold fast what is good. The truth is a good thing. The truth is a good thing. I praise God that we have the truth. I praise God that I don't have to develop the truth. Getting back to our railroad story, if the guys had simply held fast to what the truth was, that the train orders were correct, they would have stayed on. Everything would have gone great. But once they began to doubt, once they began to trust their eyes instead of what were on the orders, it was a disaster. It was a disaster. Um, in a similar fashion, what we are seeing today, church, is we are seeing entire denominations fall away from the truth. They're bailing out just like those guys did off the hand end of that train. We can't have it. Can't have it. Truth is so important. Truth is so important that Jesus himself referred to himself as the truth on more than one occasion. It blows my mind to think about the picture of Jesus standing in the, in the presence of Pilate just before he goes to the cross, and Pilate saying, ah, oh, what is truth? Pilate not understanding that he was standing in the very presence of the truth embodied. What is truth? Jesus says that truth is Really, really, really important. Here's what he says 
as he's talking to the disciples in Mark 8, and he's talking about really these end times that we're probably living through. And I love this because Jesus sometimes, he pulls no punches. He loves us, full of mercy and grace. He died for every one of us. But listen to what he says. He's talking to the disciples. He says, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Whoa. Whoa. Well, brothers and sisters, I don't want Jesus to be ashamed of me. So, and I know that you don't either. We're gonna, I'm going to call the uh, worship team back up here to the platform, and we're going to go in and worship for another song, and we're going to do really kind of the exhortation that we just read in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to worship God for who he is um, for this song. And while we're worshiping God, I want you to not only reflect on the fact that God is indeed worthy of worship, but I want you to ask God to begin to um, speak to you about, uh, about how you can better display the truth when you leave here this morning.
steadfast. Stay on board. Trust God. You are what is referred to by the scriptures as the ecclesia, the called forth. You're the called forth. You have a duty in this world in particular. You have a charge. You reflect Jesus. You speak truth. You show love. You reflect mercy and grace. Let's just pray into that. Father, I thank you for your people. I thank you, Father, that you called them forth, that you literally called them out, Lord. I thank you, Lord God, that they're steadfast in your truth, that they don't worry about what's going on around them, things that would be relative, things that would be lies, Father. I thank you, Lord God, that they look to you as the author of all truth and as a creator God that will finish the restoration that he's already started. I thank you, Lord God, that you cause each and every person here, Father God, to understand their role in that restoration that you are undertaking, Lord. Bless them and keep them, Father. Use them to be purveyors of your truth in this world. 